Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today to our February Food for Thought program. My name is Scotty Kirkland. I'm the Exhibits, Publications, and Programs Coordinator. Give you just a few announcements this morning before we introduce our speaker. Uh, we have a special book talk that will happen next week. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, February 21st at noon. It will be here. It will also be streamed live. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Sharoni Green from the University of Alabama, who has written a new book called The Chase and Ruin. This is a book about uh, Alabama native and author Zora Neale Hurston uh, and an understudied part of her career. Uh, later in her career, she spent uh, several months uh, touring Honduras on a search for some Mayan ruins and on a uh, search for a new writing project. So this is an interesting book talk uh, that you'll want to be a part of. That's the 21st. Uh, there's his next Wednesday at noon here in the Farley Auditorium or online, Sharoni Green from the University of Alabama. Uh, in March, we will start the month with our virtual series called Research Rundown, which is our history and genealogy how-to series. Uh, that's going to be an interesting one on navigating our online catalog. And so one of our collections archivists is going to walk us through all the ways that you can start your research journey into your family history or any historical project of Alabama through our online catalog. So that'll be a virtual series that'll uh, air at noon on Monday, March the 4th. Our March Food for Thought is March the 21st. Also at noon, you're seeing a pattern. Uh, also, we'll be here in this room and online. Billy Singleton uh, from Chilton County will be our speaker that day. Uh, Mr. Singleton is an expert in Alabama's aviation history. He has a new book on some of the women in early Alabama aviation stories, and he's going to be sharing those with us on uh, March the 21st. So you'll definitely want to be here for that. I uh, want to just point out to you as well that uh, last week or last month, rather, we uh, introduced uh, the Alabama History Institute, the summer uh, teacher workshops. Those uh, applications went live uh, last last month uh, in, the, in this uh, on this day. But uh, those will go through, let's see, March the 8th. So if you have teachers in your in your life that, that need professional development in the summertime and they're interested in history, whether or not they teach history or social studies or not, these are ways that they can uh, come to these professional development workshops. They can go tour history sites. They can learn about how to integrate primary sources into their curriculum, and they can use uh, wonderful resources prepared by the archives and some of our institutional partners, like the Encyclopedia of Alabama. Always happy to have Chris Maloney with us from the Encyclopedia here. Uh, and just great professional development programs for teachers. And those applications are available on our website, and we are taking those through March the 8th. So you don't want to miss that. If you haven't been upstairs yet to our exhibit, our temporary exhibit on preserving Alabama's Rosenwald schools, I encourage you to take a few moments after today's program to take a very timely stroll uh, up to the second floor and look at that exhibit, which was developed in partnership with Auburn University with uh, and with our speaker today. So very happy about that exhibit. If you do not have time to go today, uh, you can go anytime through the end of August. So history lives on preserving Alabama's Rosenwald schools is on our second floor. And I want to take just a brief moment to recognize some of the members of our audience today who uh, played a part in that exhibit. Uh, we have several people from Mount Sinai Community Center, which is the last remaining uh, Rosenwald School in Ontario County. Ladies, thank you for coming again today. When you when you tour the exhibit, you will you will see these these wonderful ladies and uh, know that all of the uh, artifacts that are on display uh, from the exhibit, the large pieces, the desks, the podium, and even the sign where the title for the exhibit comes from came from these wonderful folks in Ontario County. So we we thank you again, and we are so glad that you're here today. A final reminder that our Food for Thought Lecture Series is sponsored by our friends at the Alabama Humanities Alliance and the Friends of the Alabama Archives, which is our support organization. If you value the work that the Archives does and you would like to be a member of the Friends, you can pick up a card in the lobby. It looks just like this. We would definitely appreciate the support. Thank you for coming today. Now, our speaker today to talk about the Rosenwald exhibit uh, and, and the research project that that exhibit grew from is Gorham Bird. 
Gorham is an assistant professor of architecture at Auburn University's College of Architecture, Design, and Construction, where he teaches design studios, building technology courses, and preservation seminars. He conducts interdisciplinary research at the intersection of design, historic preservation, digital technology, and digital technology committed to resilience, equitable, and sustainable design. And you will see evidence of all of that in today's presentation and upstairs. Gorham received his Master of Science in Architecture from the University of Michigan and his Bachelor of Architecture and Bachelor of Interior Architecture from Auburn University. He's a registered architect in Alabama, Georgia, and Michigan. Gorham Burton. Well, good afternoon. Um, um, I'm honored to have each of you here uh, to, to listen in on um, my talk today. Um, a little disclaimer, I don't know if Scotty knows this, but I'm not a historian, so I, I would like to lead with that. Right? Um, uh, my, my background is in, is in architecture. I have, from a very young age, loved history um, because it has uh, helped me understand uh, where I come from, helps me uh, to understand uh, present issues and, and to understand where, where we might go in the future. Um, and so uh, for me, from a really young age, uh, buildings, architecture, uh, became uh, a fascination, uh, particularly old buildings because of that connection to the past that, that they hold. And I'll talk um, a little bit about that as well. But uh, what I wanted to focus on today was, um, you know, both from a kind of historical standpoint, but also from a kind of present day standpoint, um, the kind of history of uh, the Rosenwald School program. Uh, it is, a you know, uh, history that, uh, you know, impacts uh, much of the South, but the, I hope you take away today that it's also an Alabama history, right? It's very local and very um, uh, well connected to Alabama as, for its origin. Um, and so my, the title is uh, Black Resilience, Preserving Alabama's Rosenwald Schools. Uh, so I start here with this uh, video, there's some drone footage of a um, Rosenwald School in um, it's the New Hope School in Fredonia in Chambers County. And um, I, I start here because this is where my journey began. Uh, so much of this research has been a journey. Um, and, you know, visiting the school is actually something um, uh, I, I did with my family. We were in search of a Christmas tree farm. And I'd been looking at some of these Rosenwald schools and knew, you know, one was kind of in Chambers County where we were driving. And so, uh, I tell my family, we're going to turn down this dirt road. And an hour later, we're still kind of wandering through the woods trying to find this place. But we um, eventually eventually found it. And um, uh, anyway, have had a chance to meet uh, folks from the New Hope uh, organization and talk to them about their uh, efforts to preserve the New Hope School, which, as you can see from these images, is, has been well taken care of. Um, and it's a, a kind of local community effort there in Fredonia. But to back up, um, the Rosenwald School program um, is, is, uh, is, a, is what is uh, referred to now as the Rosenwald School program. But at the time, uh, these schools weren't called Rosenwald schools. And for anyone who attended one, uh, to hear Rosenwald attached to the name now uh, feels a little unusual. But as we study them historically, um, much of the, the credit has been given to uh, Julius Rosenwald and the kind of namesake uh, due to the support he provided. But between 1914 and 1932, uh, more than 5,000 Rosenwald buildings were built across uh, the rural South, and over 400 of them were here in Alabama. Um, and uh, you know, most of them were schools, but some of them were also um, kind of homes for teachers, uh, shops, privies, and, and other types of buildings. So the total um, kind of count is uh, 5,000. And it's important to note uh, these schools were built in a time of segregation, in a time of Jim Crow, um, and kind of rampant underfunding in, uh, in, in education across the South. Um, but just to kind of illustrate that, um, 
uh, this statistic from Lowndes County in 1909, just noting the disparity between um, kind of state funds for uh, white students versus black students. Uh, $20 per student in Lowndes County for, for white schools and 67 cents uh, per student uh, enrolled in a black school. And um, I'm not gonna unpack the kind of uh, history of Jim Crow or segregation, but uh, it, what, what the kind of big focus here is kind of understand the context of which um, these schools were a necessity, right? Um, we see this image on the top right. This is uh, the old, um, the old Tankersley School, or as I've uh, come to learn, it's the lodge uh, um, that was uh, utilized or understood to be utilized as uh, an early school for the Tankersley community that was kind of uh, being formed in that area. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk more specifically about the Rosenwald School, but what you're starting to see with these images is the um, you know, during segregation, the, the conditions in which students were, were learning. Um, and so uh, as, as we understand education today, the, the kind of quality of light, the uh, access to, um, you know, uh, heating and air conditioning, right, all of those things were non-existent this time. Um, and so the, you know, inequities existed, um, uh, particularly in the South. And so the story, at least the partnership um, of this new Rosenwald School program begins with uh, um, when these two gentlemen meet, 1911. Uh, Booker T. Washington at this point is, um, uh, has, has just formed within the last 10 years the Tuskegee Institute or Tuskegee Normal College and um, is really traveling uh, much of the U.S., um, getting support from um, white philanthropists, particularly in the North. And in 1911 meets Julius Rosenwald in Chicago. And Julius Rosenwald was the CEO of Sears and Roebuck. I have to remind my students, Sears and Roebuck was the Amazon of, of our day. And so this is effectively Jeff Bezos, right? Uh, you know, you say Sears and they're like, what are you talking about? Um, and so, uh, 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 very influential uh, person, but it's also of note a, a kind of Jewish American who understood his role uh, in in kind of um, uh, sharing in in um, in his riches and uh, being a generous person to those less fortunate. And so that became a kind of motivation for Julius Rosenwald to get involved. And so he's he's here uh, listening to Booker T. Washington talk about this dream of, of improving rural education in the South, particularly for black, uh, for black children. And uh, they, they begin to kind of test out um, uh, the design of new schools in the South. Uh, Rosenwald uh, funds uh, just with a little bit of money to kind of test some new schools and this this program explodes into um, what is argued by economists today as the the reason for creating the african-american middle class was the rosenwald school program and so uh, some of these slides you'll see in the exhibit if you haven't been up there yet but um, it's it's uh, important to kind of um, for me as an architect to understand the history i have to visualize it um, I'm a, a visual thinker, so what we're looking at is a timeline, you know, roughly from 1860 to current day, but what you're starting to see in the middle, right, around 1910 is this kind of initial, uh, this initial phase of the, the pilot program noted here in, in orange, and that is the kind of seed money that Rosenwald um, sends to Tuskegee. And so with, with, that, uh, with that money, Tuskegee uh, begins to design and, and build some pilot schools. Uh, after, the, after the kind of proof of concept is uh, generated, more money gets um, kind of funded to Tuskegee. And so Tuskegee Institute uh, is, is really uh, managing the construction uh, of these schools, the design of the schools, and um, the, the kind of popularity uh, grows so quickly that... Um, Rosenwald has to kind of move the management of the program to, to Fisk University or, or to Nashville and uh, to kind of continue uh, the, the scaling up of this program. Um, but this is important to kind of contextualize, um, you know, Plessy versus Ferguson as, uh, you know, the kind of Supreme Court case that instituted separate, uh, separate but equal policy. 
within this shift, uh, 1954 Brown v. Board of Education, where you then start to see the closure of Rosenwald schools. So many Rosenwald schools would have been open for 40 to 50 years. Um, a lot of them in Alabama open until as late as 1967 as segregated schools, uh, as you know, as well after 1954. Um, but what you start to see in the kind of orange uh, chart flowing down is a lot of those schools uh, were demolished. A lot of those schools fell into disrepair and, and collapsed. And so what we're left with today is a, a kind of small number of remaining schools, which has been the focus of my, my research. Um, it wasn't just Alabama, it was 15 states across the South. And so this is a, a map from 1934 that notes the near 5,300 schools or, or buildings completed. You can see a, a large percentage of them in the uh, kind of Black Belt region, central region of Alabama, uh, many along the kind of Mississippi River and in North South Carolina, even uh, kind of uh, East Texas in Northern Louisiana. So um, by 1914, the very first of what we now call Rosenwald schools were built in Alabama. Six schools were in that kind of first group um, in Lee, Macon, and Montgomery counties. And so following the success of that, in 1917, Julius Rosenwald really fronts much more money to uh, the Rosenwald Fund to then oversee the design and construction of schools. So by uh, 19, let's see, 32, uh, you can see the, the graph kind of moving to 1932. You can see this is the kind of concentration or number of schools across Alabama. So going back to their design, um, until 1920, like I said, the, the design and management was um, controlled by Tuskegee Institute, primarily this gentleman here, Robert R. Taylor. Uh, Robert R. Taylor is the first uh, educated and licensed uh, African-American architect in the United States. He was educated at MIT and um, was kind of well connected with uh, Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington convinces him to come to um, Tuskegee, Alabama to oversee um, both the kind of campus grounds, but also the architecture program. So for Robert R. Taylor, he's a kind of pioneer in, in um, architectural education, but also this um, kind of connection to construction. So we'll look at some slides later where uh, at Tuskegee, architecture students were taught how to how to make bricks uh, and uh, they had uh, they used the kind of the trade of making bricks as a fundraiser um, so much of Tuskegee's campus uh, the bricks built on campus were, were constructed and built and made uh, by students so Robert R. Taylor becomes responsible for these uh, first designs of the school. So um, the video we saw at the beginning is this school um, school number 11 uh, the one teacher school and uh, becomes uh, really the, the, um, a school that is built throughout the entire program. Uh, Taylor's designs are noted for the, um, the way the buildings are sited and, and sit on the, uh, on the site relative to the sun. And so he was very intentional and strategic about where windows were placed, particularly trying to get northern light into classrooms. So you have to think in, in you know, 19, 10 to 1920, rural Alabama electricity was was uh, um, not common. And so they were really designing the schools built to be kind of um, uh, utilized without uh, overhead lighting. And so capturing as much daylight as possible, um, but particularly from the north, would, would impact students' ability to read um, uh, significantly. Um, up until then in 1920, when the management of the schools shifts to Nashville, um, the, the, um, the design and the construction of the schools were then managed by architect Samuel Smith, um, who had been a field agent for Rosenwald School, so was very familiar with how the schools were being built um, and, and kind of improved the design. In terms of this kind of idea about uh, black resilience, it's really important to note um, this the Rosenwald intentionally um, didn't fund these schools 100%, right? He believed in this idea of kind of seed money. And so uh, oftentimes most schools would either have to put up the money or, or uh, pledge in-kind labor of one third of the cost of the school. And so uh, 
Julius Rosenwald believed that was a, a kind of a mutual uh, way of getting um, African American communities as well as um, kind of white communities that would would also uh, fund the schools to kind of work together, uh, cooperate on advancement of black education. So um, if any of you are familiar with Sears Modern Homes, the catalog where you could order a home from Sears and have it delivered, uh, Sears is producing that catalog at the same time as Rosenwald is now instituting a catalog of schools. So um, there, if you kind of look at some of the writings between Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington, uh, Rosenwald offers to um, kind of provide the materials that are being used in, for the Sears homes to be used for the Rosenwald uh, schools. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of funny you read the kind of letters between the two and um, Rosenwald is kind of offering this as a as a um, maybe a, like a kind gesture, uh, but Booker T. Washington is in, insistent actually that uh, the construction and the materials, like the sourcing of every part of the school, should be coming from those communities. And so uh, he actually um, declines the offer. And uh, but what what you end up seeing is the the local sawmills that are providing some of the lumber, the uh, masons who are uh, you know providing some. Of of the uh, brick and, and stone in the, in the buildings, all that material is coming locally, right? So that's um, a kind of intentional thing Booker T. Washington instituted in the program, um, which uh, I would argue Washington doesn't get as much credit as, as Rosenwald, right? But uh, this idea was, was his genius. Um, so some of the most common school designs that we see uh, throughout the, kind of the, the program, we see the one room school, one teacher school on the top left. Uh, the most common is right here in the middle in the top, the two teacher school, uh, which would have two, essentially two classrooms and one industrial room. We'll look more specifically at one of those um, uh, here in a bit. So, like I said, there were once 405 schools in Alabama, and the estimate today uh, across the country is that 10 to 12 percent uh, remain. And so that, that would mean, you know, about 18 schools in Alabama remain. Um, and we have currently documented seven of them. Um, we have identified 15. So there are potentially some out there that, um, that have not been uh, documented or, you know, the, the state or we at Auburn are aware of. So um, we know of, yeah, 15, but, but more, right? Um, and that's the kind of funny thing is um, I'm, I've been getting phone calls and emails about, hey, we think we have a school, you know, we want you to come, uh, come and check it out, and which I, I would love the opportunity to. So, so much of this journey was really at first trying to figure out, okay, where are all these schools that we know of and where are the schools we don't know of? And so um, uh, what the other kind of interesting thing is knowing or being able to determine uh, which school is, was actually funded by Rosenwald, right? Because these school programs, uh, the... Uh, the design of the schools was so efficient, affordable, it worked extremely well, that actually the state of Alabama adopted the school plans as the state-funded rural school, right? Um, so these schools that were originally designed for black children then became the state standard. Um, and so you end up seeing, historically, um, uh, schools that may have been, uh, you know, built for white students um, actually resemble and look like a Rosenwald school, but they technically aren't because they weren't funded by Rosenwald. So there's there's actually one down the street from my house. Um, it is a two-teacher school, but it is not a Rosenwald school. It looks very much like the Tankersley School on the top right, but um, it was not funded by Rosenwald. So um, in this journey of discovering and documenting these schools, what we've been able to do is utilize some of the kind of latest technology um, that's available to, to kind of uh, be able to capture the existing conditions of these schools. And so, like I said, New Hope in Chambers County is a well-preserved school. Um, uh, Tankersley, which is Montgomery County, and Hope Hole um, is at the risk of collapse, right? Um, and so you see these, uh, you know, kind of a wide range of conditions of these schools across the state. Um, and uh, so this technology that we're using is giving us the ability to um, kind of look at these schools comprehensively, um, be able to assess them structurally, and determine whether or not um, 
the buildings are in need of kind of immediate care. What we found by looking at Tankersley in the top right, um, no, that's not a skylight, that's a hole in the roof. Um, and, and then that's not a, you know, stick on the floor, that's a floor joist, you know, snapped and broken. So um, Tankersley was in immediate, uh, we, in this kind of initial assessment, we saw Tankersley as the school most in need of uh, intervention and one that without doing any anything would collapse. And um, once the roof structure is compromised the way it is, um, the, the building is likely to, to collapse. And so um, a little, I'll go quickly through the technology because it's uh, really not all that interesting. Um, uh, what I want to get to is the kind of preservation efforts, but we, we've been able to utilize um, some LIDAR uh, technology uh, as well as photogrammetry to be able to do a digital scan of these schools. And um, yes, it's it's neat to look at. It's you know, uh, you know, immersive from a kind of digital standpoint. It gets young people excited about old places. Um, but what it does in terms of uh, kind of documentation, it allows us to. Um, you know, go to the site and uh, bring as much of that information back to an office and allows us to really dig in on uh, where the issues lie and, and what, what needs to be done. So we're looking at Tankersley before any of the restoration work uh, has, has begun. And so we, we move our equipment around. Uh, we're looking uh, from the outside. We're looking from the inside. We're getting underneath the building to capture as much of that um, information uh, as possible. We've been able to get students involved, which is really great. Uh, they, they love getting out of the classroom. Uh, they love kind of traveling the state. And so we were able to take a seminar class of mine out to Tankersley to kind of be, begin to look at uh, the conditions. And... Um, through that class, they're also doing kind of historical analysis of the Rosenwald School program and beginning to kind of create a series of collages. Some that like in the middle represent the remaining schools in the state. Um, some like on the right are trying to situate civil rights in relation to the Rosenwald School program. Uh, many of the Rosenwald alumni or, or people that attended Rosenwald School became influential in the civil rights movement. And they also get to create beautiful drawings and beautiful, uh, beautiful drawings of uh, the, the school. Um, and what all of that technology does is it enables us to build what's called a point cloud, which is just a digital model of the school, but it's incredibly accurate, almost too accurate. Um, and so I can use this model to figure out to a 1 16th of an inch precision how, um, how much the roof sags in the middle or <laughs> whether or not um, you know, the, the foundation has settled over time, which uh, obviously for a 100-year-old building, it has. And so you uh, are able to look at the inside and the, uh, the outside and the inside with that technology. And that enables us to build a model, which is that on the right, a digital model that we can then use uh, for construction documents. And so we can go into the model and start to uh, frame in, uh, draw in and, and model all of the structural components that might be um, needing to be repaired and, and, and fixed. It gives us uh, a bunch of information. Again, like I said, almost too much information to work with. So this is an image that comes from that. It almost looks like an x-ray, right? It's like an x-ray of the building. So we're able to look at the bones of the building and see what's broken, what is out of plane, what needs to be fixed, and allows us to really kind of focus in on what, uh, where resources need to be, need to be spent uh, to repair a building. Allows us to produce some existing drawings, and I'm sorry, that one on the right looks terrible. I'm not sure what's happening here, but the floor plan looks a little nicer. Uh, allows us to, to generate architectural drawings and a set of construction documents that we can use uh, for preservation efforts. And so um, we have begun to kind of, um, as we document these schools, we're creating a set of drawings. And so um, in terms of preservation, 
This helps us to both understand uh, what the original school was, but also what I have been really interested in is to see how that school has changed over time, right? So if you think about the program, that this, the schools were built uh, oftentimes by members of the community. The, the teachers uh, of the schools were also members of the community. Um, there was, I'm not going to get into the whole Jeans Teachers Program, but a lot of them were funded by the Jeans Fund. Um, but um, these schools were cornerstones of the community. And um, what, what I have been really interested to look at is how over time these schools were altered, right? Um, so for example, uh, Mount Sinai on the right, um, we're able to see the original school. This is my drawings, kind of analytical drawings, looking at what you can see in white as the original footprint of the school. And then in 1935, an industrial school was expanded onto the front. They utilized the original windows, cut them out of the wall, moved, repositioned them. And then in 1949, uh, built another uh, school addition. The, I believe the 1935 edition expansion was funded by Rosenwald, and the 1949 edition was, uh, was through state funds. And so even within one building, you're starting to see this change in a funding model where the state is, is providing more funds uh, than it was originally. Tankersley is another example of that. Um, it doesn't follow perfectly the, the model of the, of the two-teacher school, but... Um, what my, my sense is that uh, they needed a third classroom. And so the industrial room, which is this front space, was just a little bit too small. And so during construction, they actually expanded uh, the front of the building uh, to take on more, provide more space. Oak Grove out in Hale County um, had a 1950s industrial room addition to make a cafeteria. Right, where they were feeding students um, in, in the school. So to me, those additions, those alterations speak to the resilience of the communities because they were uh, savvy enough to reuse what they had and um, you know, kind of resilient to, to kind of work through the challenges of, of adding on to a building, but, but very resourceful, right? And um, that's, uh, that's been uh, really uh, eye-opening to me in terms of kind of understanding um, uh, the influence of these schools. Also, you're seeing in these little pie charts uh, the amount of funding that uh, the community raised or the state provided um, or Rosenwald provided. So the state being um, the state being uh, the kind of the light orange and the, the community being the dark orange. So what you start to see over time is the percentage Rosenwald gave more of a percentage earlier in the program and less of a percentage in the later part of the program, right? So the state began to fund these schools as more and more of them got built. So bringing us to uh, preservation efforts today, right? So schools closed um, following integration. And, um, you know, my perception of integration as a, as a white kid who grew up in, you know, middle Georgia um, was, a, was a good thing, right? Integration meant we were going to be taught the same way and went to the same schools and had the same opportunities. What I've learned from meeting with uh, alumni of the Rosenwald schools is integration also had this dark side, right? Uh, a side where black kids who, you know, were then bussed out of their communities into a, a school where they became um, the minority, right? And they were also removed from, uh, no longer were their teachers their neighbors, right? But the teachers were, were someone else. And so, um, Integration led to also the closure of these schools and the collapse of these schools and the kind of connection that they had to communities. So here we are looking at Tankersley with the roof, uh, the hole in the roof. Um, as bright as it is, it's really not great uh, for the architecture and the structure of the building. We're starting to see the, the roof trusses in the, in the top are buckled, they've cracked, um, and it is at risk of collapse. And so we partnered with the Tankersley uh, Alumni Organization to apply for the National Park Service uh, grant program called the African American Civil Rights Grant. And we were awarded that grant in uh, 2022. Um, it was a $500,000 grant 
sorry, $499,799. Yeah, got to be precise about that. Um, but um, what we have seen um, is that there was a uh, both a need and a, a real kind of energy and um, enthusiasm about preserving the school. Of the schools in Alabama, so architecturally speaking, historically speaking, Tankersley is probably the most in its original condition. We have uh, specifically on the interior, these interior wall panels, uh, chalkboards, cabinets are all original. And so many, many schools that we've seen over time have been altered or original material has been removed, but um, Tankersley is like this perfectly preserved jewel on the inside. So we've had many community meetings uh, actually out in Raymer um, to, to talk with the Tankersley community and some alumni about what are the kind of hopes of what the Tankersley school could become, right? And um, and uh, with, with the help of Dorothy Walker, if any of you know Dorothy Walker, say so she's the queen of Rosenwald schools. Uh, she's been a wealth of knowledge. Um, but uh, she she's been instrumental in, in kind of leading some of these discussions with um, with alumni groups. Um, and uh, the kind of initial stage of what we've been working on is um, well, let me, let me back up. The alumni group was was thrilled to get the grant, as were we so excited. Um, and uh, you know, we had our first meeting. They're like, "Well, when when can we?" You know, they were ready to swing hammers. Is my joke. They they were ready to get started, um, and so that enthusiasm is is just such a great thing. Um, we had to pretty quickly in this in this meeting kind of talk through the logistics of preservation and the kind of requirements of preservation. Uh, preservation is a slow process, and um, particularly if it's funded by a government uh, entity, and that's not because the government's inefficient. Um, that's because preservation is a very methodical process. And um, you are in a preservation project, you're making permanent changes. And so uh, both um, uh, architects as preservationists, as well as the National Park Service wants to be really intentional and really uh, confident in the choices you're making with a preservation project. And so, um, you know, it's taken some time um, and so what we have been able to do since we got the grant, uh, it doesn't seem like much, but it actually is a big deal. We've been able to stabilize the structure. Um, you know, I, I kept having these kind of nightmares, like some, some thoughts in the middle of the night that, you know, a bad storm would come through and Tankersley would collapse. And, and it would, if we had a bad hurricane or tornado, the, the building would be gone. Um, and now I can sleep a little bit better knowing that uh, we've had a structural engineer come and, um, you know, help us design sta temporary stabilization. And so we've, um, you know, stabilized the, the roof with these temporary walls and gone in and, and re, uh, reframed the roof um, itself so we can feel a little bit better. We've put a kind of temporary tarp over the, over the roof and put a fence around the project. But with, after that, there's been this whole process of meetings with the National Park Service to look at um, what the, this rehabilitation would look like. And so uh, this project funds just the kind of exterior rehabilitation and so we are going to, as you can start to see, the scope of work we've developed is uh, replace the roof completely. So that structure and everything, it will have a new roof frame and uh, new roofing. Uh, we will restore all the exterior windows. Um, one beautiful thing about Tankersley is um, someone who is taking care of the building had the foresight to remove the windows and protect them. So you look at some of those photos and the windows are boarded up, but they've also removed them. And so we have uh, all, every single original window. Um, and so we're gonna go through a restoration uh, process uh, and replace some doors and redo the siding. So from the exterior, the, the building will be perfectly preserved. Um, but going back to what does the future look like for the school, um, there have been talks about um, turning the school into a community center. Um, and we, we've talked through what does that mean? What does that look like? And, and some of that could be providing um, 
kind of after school programs, tutoring sessions, um, utilizing obviously the, the school for reunions, as I know Mount Sinai does. Um, the, I met some folks down in Midway at Old Merritt School, and, and they actually host uh, elections, uh, local elections within the Rosenwald School there, which I think is a pretty incredible thing uh, considering the history. And so um, we're, we're actually uh, waiting to hear back. We've applied for an additional grant through the National Park Service to fund the remainder of the preservation of the school, which will uh, address the kind of interior of the building as well as, you know, creating a parking lot and all the accessibility requirements of a public building. But, uh, you know, designing a, a new ADA ramp on the back of the building and bathrooms and really making it a, a modern facility that could, uh, you know, really give back to the community and the kind of surrounding area. So um, going back to like this, um, idea and, and the kind of connection of the archives to this whole project. There are so many, um, you know, this Alabama archives is such a resource. If you're, if you're new to kind of um, exploring the archives, I have just been astounded to see what is in this building. Uh, and these are just a few examples, right? We have in the middle, this is my favorite, um, a fundraising bulletin. Uh, this is the uh, what is the school? I've forgotten. Well, it's in it's in Chambers County, so this this might actually be New Hope, but uh, they they have a, a barbecue where uh, Booker T. Washington's um, I believe his son will be attending. Yes, Booker T. Washington Jr. will be attending uh, a fundraiser, as well as uh, Professor uh, uh, Mountain from Tuskegee will be there as well. So anyway. Um, I have learned about the, the, the ways in which funds were raised by uh, uh, members of Rosenwald schools. Fish fries were very common, barbecues. Um, it's really been kind of eye-opening, again, to the kind of resilience. And I, I don't, uh, I know in my talk, I've, I've focused on the buildings, right? Um, but I hope that doesn't come across as me neglecting the people, right? Um, and so the, the, Obviously, these, these buildings um, are there to create an opportunity for kids, right? create an opportunity for kids to learn to read and write, um, create a kind of opportunity for, for teachers from the north to come and, and, and meet kids in the south, right? Um, and the kind of the impact of, of these buildings on people's lives has been uh, incredible. To, to kind of learn about. Um, if you haven't been upstairs yet, um, uh, I'll, after, after our talk, after some questions, I'll be happy to go up there and, and walk around with you. But um, really for me, the, the exhibit is all about uh, lifting up the voices of these communities across the state who um, have worked to sustain these schools, preserve these schools, uh, and, um, you know, kind of lift, uh, uplift the, the story and the narrative, right? Because I think so often in historic preservation, the, the history that has been preserved is not always been the full history of a, of a place, of a community. And so um, by kind of bringing the history to life uh, as the, the, um, the title of the exhibit suggests, we start to illustrate kind of inequities that existed, but also the resilience of the communities. And uh, for me, uh, this was also eye-opening. Um, buildings hold stories. And so this is the Harris Barrett School um, in Macon County. It predated any Rosenwald school, uh, built in 1903. This is before Rosenwald even met um, Booker T. Washington. But this is Booker T. Washington partnering with Harris Barrett, a banker in Virginia to fund a school. And these bricks are built by Tuskegee students. Um, it is now a museum in, uh, on a county road in Macon County. The most beautiful thing is the DNA, the fingerprints of the people who, who built the bricks, who made the bricks. Uh, the fingerprints are embedded in the building itself, right? So here we have this photo from the Library of Congress of Tuskegee students building bricks and the, um, the kind of meaning and the connection of those bricks into um, a rural school. 
So uh, I've used this slide before. It doesn't quite work anymore because of uh, some, some updates, but you can, if you grew up in the South and you wanna know if there was a rural Rosenwald school in your county, you can use the Rosenwald database from Fisk University, uh, search by state, by county, and it will give you a list of all the schools built. I say that with an asterisk because uh, Fisk is currently updating and making changes to the database. They're modernizing it. Um, and so it's temporarily uh, shut down, but you could, this hyperlink uh, will take you to the database and you can get an update for when it will be uh, published again. It's rosenwald.fisk.edu. Uh, and I've, in previous talks, I've had students kind of pull up and, and find, oh wow, there were five Rosenwald schools in my county. So um, next steps, um, I've talked about the Old Merritt School a little bit uh, down in Midway, but they received um, a 2023 Alabama Historical Commission grant called the Preservation of Alabama's Significant Sites. And we worked with them to uh, apply for that grant and kind of assist in the application of that grant. And so uh, this is the school that hosts elections. Um, if I had more time, if I had the rest of the day and all of your interest, I would talk about a, a building program that followed the Rosenwald School program, which was the equalization schools. Some of you might be aware of that. Um, this is an example of uh, a school that has a Rosenwald School and equalization school on the same site. Um, it's a really incredible example, but this is Midway down in Bullock County. Um, well, that concludes everything. Uh, I would love to take some questions from you guys. If anyone has have some, we have a, a microphone that can be passed so everyone is able to hear. Thank you all. All right, our first question will come from our in-person audience, but just want to remind our online audience, if you've got questions, drop them in the comments, um, and our online audience will bring you a microphone. Okay, my question is this. Um, currently, our elementary building, Rosenwald, we think still exists. Mm. Well, the building is there. It's functional. We're using it. We have been told that it's not a Rosenwald school. You commented that you can look at the bones. Mm. Would it be possible to look at our bones? It looks exactly, everything's intact, mm -hmm. like the Sinai school. Mm -hmm. Three original rooms, back to back, mm -hmm. with the what the sliding door, yep. cloak rooms. Mm -hmm. A fourth room was added, founded on this site. All the information, 1920, 1921 budget. Mm -hmm. In 1931, we had a visit from a Walt Rosenwald agent mm. who commented and made notes about the school. Okay. Windows, everything is there. How do we confirm? <laughs> we say it is, we mm -hmm. know it is. Mm -hmm. Information was sent into the historical um, commission yeah. and it's a historical site, mm -hmm. Alabama historical site. How do we confirm officially what it is? Yeah, that's, I, I love that question. I mean, um, I would first of all love to come and see it. Um, where Where is the school? Oh, it's in Coosa County, Alabama. There were Coosa. five schools built in Coosa County, five Rosenwald schools. Our school was the first mm -hmm. Coosa, it was the first training school mm -hmm. in Alabama. So is it Coosa County Training School? Is that the name? It was Coosa County Training School, yes. Mm -hmm. And I have a whole package of information okay. I can provide to you. How amazing. I just want to first say, like, that is one goal of all of these kind of um, opportunities to, to talk and meet with people and, and hear these stories, that gets me excited. Um, the kind of nuance of whether or not it's considered a Rosenwald school, we'll have to figure it out. Uh, and I, I would love, I'd love to be able to um, help with that um, in Coosa County. And, um, you know, we can look at maybe why it hasn't been or you know, statements from the past that say why it hasn't been considered a Rosenwald school. But uh, if there's compelling evidence, yeah, I would love to help to correct correct the record. Yes, yeah, and we also have an equalization school, mm -hmm. just like the Midway you show, mm -hmm. back to back. 
Yeah, it's on the, on the same there. property. Same property. Okay. Same property. What, what's the town in Coosa? It's Cottage Grove, Alabama. Cottage Grove. Cottage Grove, Alabama, okay. near Rockford, Alabama, which is the county seat. I left my telephone number and I can provide okay. additional information. To yes, you. I can give you my card too. I love I love to chat more. Thank you so much. Wow. Well, we have the picture, but not like Lucy Washington was there. She gave them eight hundred dollars. Oh, huh. right across the school. Okay. Had a, had a school had a building name there after her. That was in nineteen fifteen. Okay. Came to the site. We have all the documented history. All right, let's let's chat after this. I'd love to love to talk more. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Hi. Thank you so much for that informative uh, presentation, and uh, you answered a few of my questions. But I'm just wondering, who technically owns the schools? Is it the state, the county, or the towns? Are the you know just the communities? Um, you know where they're located yes that is a, a complicated answer um and and it goes back to the kind of origins of the program and so um as i'm even learning today there are family members here in the audience whose whose family have uh were original owners of the property and then sold the property to uh, build the rosenwald school um, and so Part of the match grant that Rosenwald would provide is the communities uh, would have to either put up money or put up property to uh, guarantee um, the kind of match grant from Rosenwald. And so, um, you know, I, I, I have met some um, some folks who own uh, private individuals who own a school in Macon County, the Cecil School, uh, because the the land was never deeded to the school, right? And so now she as an individual having inherited the land owns the school. Um, and so it is a kind of case by case. It just depends on whether or not the state of Alabama would have bought the, the property from the school if it was ever a part of the county uh, kind of educational system. Um, I know, I'm trying to think of some other examples, Merritt School in Midway, uh, that school functioned as an elementary school for a number of years. And so it is owned by the Bullock County you know, Education Board. Um, and so it's, it's a case by case. But um, yeah, if it, were, if it were owned by the state, we, we actually might have a little bit more record or kind of documentation of how many exist. Uh, be, but because it's, um, you know, the, the kind of, a lot of schools were built probably well before record keeping was a priority. Um, and so unless unless organizations have the deed or something like that, we don't necessarily know who who owns them. But um, yeah, I would love to hear. Are there any other uh, funny instances of ownership that anyone in the in the audience is aware of? Yeah. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, originally. In 1899, I found a purchase 300 acres of land mm -hmm. for a school. And after he passed away, the trustees deeded the land to the state. Mm -hmm. In 2000, when um, property was being auctioned off, the elementary school especially, my aunt went over, saw it in the paper, and purchased. She didn't have any money. She purchased the school building, that elementary building, for a thousand dollars, and later got the money from another uh, community member. Wow! The, the old park, oh, and wow. they paid it off and everything. So the land, the three hundred acres, went to the state. Mm -hmm. So we purchased the elementary building. Okay. Then the county, the state board of education, came back and deeded us. We got a deed. For ten acres. Okay. Other, whether the um, the brick building. Okay. The equalization, the equalization oh, okay. building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the founder's grave is on that ten acres. Okay. And we're trying to get more land that's still left, but it was basically up for sale. Right. Somebody so, else bought the dormitory. Okay. From nineteen hundred. So the ten acres um, includes both schools. 
No. No. The elementary just... <laughs> building is one acre only. Okay. The equalization building in the grave site is 10 acres. Okay. The dormitory is another acreage. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We got the main piece. Yeah, that's right. We just need to know what it is. Yeah, un Officially. understand, understand. I love to help figure that yeah, out. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Um, there's a Rosenwald School just west of Auburn, and I don't know what highway that is. What is the name of it? Yeah, that's that? Highway 14. It's the Lochapoca School. Oh, it's Lochapoca. Lochapoca. So, yeah, I, I, I didn't include the very first Rosenwald School. So the very first Rosenwald School, it was the first by three days. But uh, I, I talked about those six schools that Booker T. Washington gave a little, or uh, Julius Rosenwald gave a little bit of money for those pilot schools, um, the, the Lee County school was Lochapoca. And it wasn't Lee County then, but anyway. Um, uh, it was the Lochapoca school. And then the Natasolga school was built three days later, um, or opened three days later. But the, you know, the, the photograph that came out was of the Lochapoca school, and there was a huge celebration. And um, so um, then two schools in Montgomery County, uh, Madison Park, and I'm going to blank on the other name. I don't. Um, and Big Zion, yes. Um, and then Macon County, additional schools there. But the Lochapoca School was a. And it funny, uh, funny enough, doesn't doesn't match any of these other schools. Uh, so it was like a one-off design. Yep. Um, I'm not familiar with the term industrial rooms. Mm -hmm. Yes. So. Um, the term industrial room, so um, to a succinct answer would be uh, Booker T. Washington and so much of what Tuskegee was um, kind of uh, pushing or advocating for in the South was industrial education. And so that would be similar to what we would consider today as a kind of technical education, right? Hands-on, practical, technical skills. But um, what, uh, what Booker T. Washington understood about these communities was that many of these kids were likely working on their parents' farm. And, uh, and you know, uh, you can understand a parent saying, you don't have time to go learn to read and write. I need you working in the field. Uh, and so part of his dream and vision for these schools was both, uh, you know, what we would consider today as kind of traditional education, the, you know, the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, you guys heard that before, but then also utilizing the industrial room as a way to teach trades. And so uh, the archives has these incredible pictures of uh, schools and, and, and children, um, boys learning to make uh, farm tools, um, girls learning basket weaving, um, so it was sewing, right? So it was both a kind of learning how to read, write, uh, and do math, but also build a trade or build, uh, pick up some skills that, <laughs> that potentially would allow. Uh, the other interesting thing is the school time period uh, often followed uh, kind of crops and, and harvest, right? And so summer, you know, you, you might, the, the, it wasn't a traditional school time that we, follow today, right? It was, uh, if, if kids needed to be out working in the family farm, uh, they were afforded that time and, and they would make up class, you know, they would adjust when school would open and close. I mean, just really very different from how we think of education today. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, when you look at the, our history from the industrial room, mm -hmm. where they were making chairs and baskets mm -hmm. and things for the community. Um, even uh, I think they wrote some um, church pews and mm. carvings and things <laughs> like that. It's very so. Yes, when we go back to ask our family about the history and why was that room set off to be different, mm -hmm. and they said that you know, well, they didn't say industrial room. Right. That was a working room. Yeah, working room. Uh, I've also heard them called community rooms, and so this even this idea of. Uh, I, I know there's in, in the exhibit, there's some um, uh, um, prints of, um, what is the right word? Um, 
there was a lot of canning and jam making in community rooms. And so they would be taking, you know, strawberries that were grown and, and work on jamming and then uh, sell the, the jam and jellies as a fundraiser too. So there's some existence of those, um, of those uh, labels. That's the word I was looking for uh, in the, in the exhibit. So, but yeah, this, I love, I love, rethinking those rooms, not as industrial rooms, but as community rooms, right? That, that were you know, used to impact the people in the community, right? Not just about it, learning a skill or something like that. Anyone else? Oh, oh one more. All right. That'll be our last question okay. for today. <laughs> I was curious about, is there anything more to say about ways that uh, people are using Rosenwald schools today besides what you mentioned? Yeah. Or, or maybe just categorize what are the main uses? Main uses, yeah. So um, it's very common for them to be converted into museums. Um, and, um, you know, so you, you, there's evidence of a lot of these becoming kind of rural museums. Um, but the, you know, if you think about that use, it's um, it's a significant use, an important one, uh, but but not always a way to draw a bunch of people, right? Um, we've it, um, the uh, New Hope School here was actually. Uh, I didn't mention this, but a lot of Rosenwald schools were the communities that established the school were likely coming from a church. The church was the kind of community, uh, if you want to think about it as an organization, but that was the nucleus of the community was the church. So many of these schools are actually built on the property or near a, a, a church. And so um, the New Hope School, uh, when the New Hope School shut down, uh, the the minister of the church actually converted the school into a residence uh, up until, uh, I want to say, the 80s. And so then the New Hope Foundation has been converting. You can see, um, basically, they, they cut out uh, the kind of front cloak rooms to create a screen porch, a front porch to the house and, um, and put up a few walls inside. But um, so some, some have had other lives as residences. Um, but I think the, the, uh, there's a lot of examples. I'm thinking of a couple schools in Georgia that serve as community centers that are about uh adult education or kind of uh, function like a senior center that might have sewing classes and um, some have gardening uh, classes. What I didn't, what I haven't talked about is the whole campus of the Rosenwald uh, schools. It wasn't just a building, but it was a whole campus. There were baseball fields that were, there were gardens. Uh, children learned to, you know, again, pick up skills of farming. Um, and uh, so there, there was a really a big emphasis on the design of the entire site, not just the architecture in the building. Um, so uh, what we end up finding is a lot of schools are on a big plot of land, you know, and um, that's kind of an interesting part. Um, but community centers seem to be a, a good use, particularly if there's an active alumni group that might host uh, reunions in the old school. Um, I, again, I love this idea of a polling place um, as a kind of, if you think about the <clears throat> uh, fight for kind of voting rights um, and the kind of history of that and the history of the Rosenwald schools as a segregated school, to see like people be able to vote in a, in a school that once was segregated is kind of a, a beautiful story, I think. Yeah. <laughs> More. We can take a few more. <laughs> we, we've also uh, built a walking track around our school because mm -hmm. of the property. Mm -hmm. It's large, and uh, so that has helped us for people to come out and be visible and to be able to enjoy that. Yeah. And it also serves as a, a baseball field. Oh. <laughs> and we each year, well, we have a reunion mm -hmm of alumni that did attend, and that helps us with the fundraising. When people come home to their old school, mm -hmm. um, that is one way we are, and we are, we are, we did receive uh, a grant to help us with 
restabilizing, re restoring the school. Mm -hmm. So we're just beginning the process. That's exciting. Yeah, I would love to talk more. Well, we received the past grant, but we are getting ready to start construction as soon as you know we get our information and everything together. Okay. And uh, I want to ask uh, if you get the past grant, can, can you qualify for the um, for the um, I think it's the National Parks grant. <laughs> So um, I don't think there would be anything limiting you uh, to be eligible for the National Park Service grant. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't state you can't receive other grants. Um, uh, what I would say is that receiving a grant and, and showing progress and that you've, you know, use those funds appropriately, if you've made progress, that is a, like, the federal government loves to see that. They will fund that any day. I, I say that, but... You know, I'm not making those decisions, um, but it, it shows it shows the organization's serious. You're you're getting things done. So I would say, I mean, it's no, no. Uh, I would I would apply yeah, for sure. We're gonna need some more. We just got enough to really get started. Yes. And, um, you know, do a portion of it, and we need some more money. And so uh, I'm just asking so that you know it would be safe to. Apply after we get started. Mm. Mm -hmm. Next one, so. Yeah, I would love to chat more because I, I, I could. Yes, yeah, sounds great. All right, um, I, I think we'll we'll close it. We'll close our questions for, for the hour. But um, if you've got some more, Mr. Bird will be around, um, and also would love to in, encourage you, again, to um, see the exhibit upstairs. Uh, it's to the right off the elevator if you're taking the elevator and encourage that. Um, one last reminder, if you should have a survey in front of you, if you enjoyed the program today, please be sure to complete that and you can leave it on the table outside. Um, would y'all join me again in thanking Mr. Bird. Thank you. Thank you.